What was that? Is that a duck call or something? Good morning, guys. Begin to worship the Lord this morning. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. Let's try that again from the top. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Here we go. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Yes, the earth is filled with his glory. Let's try that again from the top. Stand and lift up our hands. Come on. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Stay with me, boys. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome. All right, come on, you guys. Sing it from the top one more time. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. Bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. Together we sing. And everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord. Yes, the earth is filled with his glory. It's rising up. It is rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. It is rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. Together we sing. Come on now. Everyone sing together. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God. The earth is filled with His glory, and the earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Yes, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Praise 
Him and praise Him. We praise Him and lift Him up. Come on. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. And come on and praise Him. We praise Him and lift Him up. Him one more time. Lift your voice. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Come on. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Good morning, men. Woo! Come on, that's a tight band right there. That's a band that does not mess around. <laughs> we got to get him a band with flowers painted on it, Lars. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, happy Wednesday, you guys. Thanks for being here. We got a lot of work to do today, let me tell you. A uh, couple things. Couple things, couple things. Man, I'm so glad that weather broke. Hey, I enjoyed the heat, don't get me wrong, but man, it makes me drink more water than I'm used to. Uh, hey, Warren, thank you very much for taking the helm the last three weeks. You did a really good job, man of God. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. A uh, couple real quick announcements. Uh, this Saturday, right in here, is our men's breakfast. Um, <laughs> it will be a men's breakfast that you've never experienced before, I got to tell you. The man that's given his testimony um, has never done it before, uh, and there's a reason he hasn't done it before. Uh, this was a man who was abused beyond anything that, you can, uh, that you've ever considered. His uh, stepfather used to wake him up by peeing on him in the morning. Uh, it's things like that. You're going to hear a testimony of man. I'm going to interview him rather than him giving his testimony so that we get everything out that, that we want to. But here's the kicker. The guy's a phenomenal man of God. He loves the Lord, and the Lord reached down into the pits of his, his despair and saved him. So you're going to hear quite a story. But word of admonishment, it's probably not a men's breakfast for 
uh, immature um, young men. Uh, I don't know what the age is. You as a father will have to determine that, but uh, uh, there's sexual sins and stuff in there that, that is important for the foundation of his story. So uh, just a word of caution, all right? So that's this Saturday at 7.30. Um, yes, 0.7.30. Uh, Bob King, if it was a breakfast, if it was a dinner, it would be 19.30. Yes. Uh, look at, yeah, hey, look at this. Look, look what we got here. Hey, uh, Steve, would you stand up? S show him your back. Show him your back. This is, yeah, look at this. We got T-shirts for Dan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're. They're 25 bucks a piece. Come and see this man of God right here. He's got them. You got them on the back table? Okay, we'll put them on the back table. Very good. But uh, if, uh, if you're so inclined, uh, buy one. Show, this, show your support for Dan. You can also get a yard sign. I love those yard signs. You know, I got one in my, I got one in my yard, Dan. And um, I've had so many people come up to me and say, where can I get one of those? You got to come on Wednesday morning to Band of Brothers. That's how you get one of those. Uh, so they are, uh, they're seven bucks. Put a $10 in there. It helps uh, the ministry and everything else, and we'll keep going. Also on, on Saturday, there is a work uh, detail out at Whisper Canyon um, that you can, uh, if, if you're interested in doing that, get with Goody. Last thing, I want to introduce you to a man. You've probably heard him. He's been around. He's uh, running for Congress. Uh, and uh, we're going to plug him into Band of Brothers, courtesy of, uh, of Warren. Um, Andy Caldwell, would you stand up? Say hello to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Andy's running for, uh, he's running for Congress. He's looking to uh, unseat Salud Carbajal. I don't know if... <laughs> so... Uh, we're, we're going to do our best to introduce you to the, to, uh, to the band of brothers and, and whatnot over the next few weeks, okay? Thanks for being here, sir. Um, that is all I have for now. Uh, the reason I am uh, kind of rushing through this a little bit, I don't feel like I'm rushing, but uh, the man that you're going to hear from here in a minute, I'll introduce him in a second, but he really is pushing hard for 30 minutes up here. Uh, <laughs> you know that's difficult. Uh, Yes, yeah, so 30 minutes is, I, I have no issues with that, but then we got to get moving. Um, so around your table, you have some questions and you have some scripture. Now listen, really, really think about these questions and, and have an honest discussion, and we will get back together here again in about 10 minutes. God bless you guys.
How are we doing, men? Are we doing good? This is a good looking tie here now. Look at that. Okay, he's here. Delaney's here today. Hey, a couple more minutes, you guys. Two more minutes. Okay, boys. I'm I'm sorry, not boys, men. <laughs> How we doing? How we doing? Hey, uh, real quick with them T-shirts. Those T-shirts. If you buy a T-shirt, the proceeds are going to go to Overwhelmed by Grace. I don't think I mentioned that before. That's important to know. Hey, I need to introduce you to a great man of God. Many of you know him and perhaps have heard him uh, speak before, uh, but this is the first time that he's taken the pulpit here. Um, he is a alley cat, this man, but I tell you what, he loves the Lord. He is a dear friend of mine. He's part of my small group on Wednesday nights. Um, Randy has been a pastor for 20 years. Um, he's been... Uh, uh, he pastored the uh, Brian Church down in, was that in San Luis? Arroyo Grande for, for a period of time. He has a Master of Divinity from International School of Theology. Uh, he's got a, a son in the Navy. Uh, he has a beautiful daughter. He's a, he's a really, really dear friend of mine. And it seemed only reasonable when we're in the book of James and we need to hit some of these harder theological discussion points that we would have Randy come and just kind of hit us between the eyes, right? So if you would help me welcome to the pulpit, Randy Bossom. Well, good morning, gentlemen. It has been my dream for a long time to have the opportunity to speak to you. In 1979, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan with the United States Marine Corps. My commanding officer hey, was uh, Lieutenant Steiger. Lieutenant Steiger was a gunnery sergeant. He was a Mustanger who became an officer, did three tours of duty in Vietnam. He was a no-nonsense kind of man. I had to charge the gates of hell with that man because I knew I'd come back alive. He was a great man. I really appreciated him. All these years, I'm still thinking about him. Captain Steiger and I, um, he got promoted to captain during my one-year tour in Okinawa, and he came to me one day, and we had a great rapport. He said, Bossom, how far can you run? Because he knew every night I'd run three, four, five, six miles around the base, and then Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I was taking karate also, and he was a black belt in karate, so we had a rapport. He came to me one day, he goes, Bossom, how far can you run? I said, I, I, I don't know, sir. He said, I want you to go out Saturday. You to run as far as you can do you pass out. And I want you to go back in Monday and tell me how far you ran. I said, aye, aye, sir. It's not for the faint of heart. This is Okinawa. Humidity, heat. 
That Saturday, I went out and I ran 18 miles. I came back in and I, uh, Captain Steiger on Monday morning said, Boston, how far did you go? I said, sir, I, I ran 18 miles, sir. It was good. I want you to catch a back flight, military air command flight from Okinawa up to Iwakuni, mainland Japan in two weeks. And I want you to run the marathon for our company, to represent our company. And I said, sir, I, this is the 70s. I'm 19 years old. I said, sir, I, I don't know anything about running no marathon. He goes, what I say? <laughs> aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. We landed in Iwakuni. It was fogged in. The C-130 had to do five go-arounds to land. I told the guy, I told the flight engineer, give me a parachute. I'll go out the back of this thing, man. I am not crashing with this C-130. I was serious because I jumped out of the back of helicopters and stuff. Uh, by the way, if you've never run out of a Chinook, that twin blade, if you've never started at the firewall between the, the pilots and the, and the cargo bay and ran all the way down through the cargo bay and launched out the back, you haven't lived yet, gentlemen. That is fun. <laughs> So I was serious. I said, give me a parachute. I'll jump. I'll, I'll jump out of this thing. But I'm not crashing with this C-130. Anyway, we got into, into the barracks that night. A couple of guys from Okinawa had flown up, and we were in the barracks. And I said, guys, aren't we supposed to do something tonight to, like, prepare? I mean, tomorrow we're running 26.3 miles. And one guy said, yeah, we have to carb load. I said, carb load? What is that? And one of my buddies says, it's when you drink a lot of beer. I wasn't saved, so we went out and carb loaded that night. <laughs> I got up the next morning, and the last thing I felt like doing was running a marathon. <laughs> but I did it for the company, and I did it for Captain Steiger. I wanted him to be proud, and I did it in four hours and five minutes, not for the faint of heart. This morning's message is like that. It's not for the faint of heart. And that's why I'm glad I'm speaking to men this morning, because I don't have to pull my punches. It's a tough passage. When you get your Bible, it really should be printed on the front of your Bible, not for the faint of heart. There are some hard things that are said in Scripture. And I know I'm going to upset somebody today. I know somebody's going to get angry. I'm okay with that. Even Jesus couldn't avoid that. But if you get angry, if you get frustrated, I want you to take it like a man. Come forward after this sermon and take it out on Scott Peterson. Okay? <laughs> He's a cop. He can take it. He's been in fights before. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. This morning I want to talk to you about what the difference is between justification and sanctification. If we ever need a message in evangelicalism that will revolutionize the church, that will bring reform to the church, it's distinguishing between justification and sanctification because we have confused the issues and the church is weak. The men of the church don't understand doctrine, they don't understand their Bibles, and they don't understand whether I'm supposed to work hard for Jesus or let go and let God. Well, this morning we're going to put the final nail in that coffin. We're going to nail this thing down, but you're going to have to bear with me because it is not for the faint of heart. Before we talk about justification, the difference between justification and sanctification, we have to define our terms. When you study theology and doctrine as in law... You learn, the first thing you learn is words mean something. The definition of words means something. My biggest issue with the seeker-driven uh, uh, church today is the fact that we're using terms, but we're not defining them. We're allowing the listener, the hearer, to define the terms. And we need to define our terms biblically. So you got to hold on, gentlemen. you got to put your six-point harness on and strap in for this one, okay? I'm going to define justification. In layman's terms, justification is when a sinner looks to Christ on the cross realizing that all of the wrath of God that he deserves has been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And in return, that 33 years of a perfect, holy life is credited to you. Warren always, is always talking about that's a good deal for a Jew. You know, a Jew likes a good deal. Gentlemen, that's the best deal you'll ever get. That's the best deal. When you look by faith to Jesus Christ and your sins are wiped out, all the wrath of God is taken off of you, placed on Christ. He suffers that eternity in hell for you, and then you receive his, his 33 years of perfect righteousness. You ever wonder why Jesus had to live 33 years? Because he had to earn that righteousness before the Father that is now credited to you. That's called double imputation. God imputes your sins to Christ, and he imputes Christ's righteousness by faith alone to you. 
Justification is the once for all, once for all, once for all time. It only happens once, the moment you believe. Justification is a declarative act. You are declared in the courts of God, holy. It is the declarative act whereby the Christian is pronounced righteous, not made righteous. You are declared righteous and perfectly holy by faith alone before an infinitely holy God. In justification, the sins of the believer, that's you, are nailed to the cross with Christ. God's wrath is finally satisfied in Jesus' sacrificial death, his perfections, his full obedience and his excellencies are fully credited to your account. In summary, I would say God loves you based on the perfections of Jesus Christ. God sees in you as the believer the excellencies, the splendor of Jesus Christ. He, can, he cannot fellowship with you on any other basis. So men, enjoy that. You don't have to earn it. Best gift you've ever received. At this point, you are born again by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. You've been justified. Now, based on that justification, there are always good works that follow. If you read Martin Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, John Knox of the Reformation, they will say you can never separate sanctification from justification. If you don't have sanctification, you never had justification. Sanctification is the process by which you are made holy. In justification, you are declared holy. In sanctification, you are made holy. You are set aside for God's holy purposes. The implements in the temple were said to be holy. What made them holy? God sanctified them. God set them aside for his holy purposes and said, These implements do not leave the temple area. They are for my purposes and my purposes only. I've got a thing hanging down here somewhere. So sanctification is the lifelong process whereby the Christian grows in practical holiness, conforming his affections to what Christ loves, transforming his thoughts in order to think God's thoughts after him, and to practice righteousness according to Scripture's commands. It is in sanctification the man of God's, the man of God's will it's in sanctification, the man of God's will becomes one with God's will for his life. With John the Baptist, we say, with joy, he must increase, I must decrease. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, you were justified by faith alone. Now you have peace. You have peace with God. As the psalmist said, now righteousness, which was your enemy, which made you hostile to God, righteousness and peace have now kissed they've been reconciled in jesus christ philippians 2 12 and 2 13 now that you're justified work it out don't work for it you've got it you've got it now work it out with fear and trembling because it's god who is at work in you to will he transforms your will to will and to do for his good pleasure ephesians 2 10 you were created Poema in the Greek, artistic creation of God. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Titus 2.14, he redeemed us. Christ redeemed us. A people for his own possession. Zealous, zealous, red hot in the Greek. Zealous, zealous for good works. John 17, 17, how do, we, how do we become more holy? Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, his high priestly prayer. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. That's why Scott and, and Pastor Gus and Pastor Mike are always leading you back to the word of God. It makes you holy. It's dynamic. It's powerful. It alone has the ability to transform your life. So justification is your declared holy, sanctification is you're working that holiness out day by day and you're growing in that sanctification. And as we go to the, the book of James here, you might want to turn to James chapter 2 verse 10. James' point here is that when we call people, when we evangelize, when we call people to Jesus Christ, when we call them to salvation in Jesus Christ alone, 
We're calling them to believe in Christ and believe that Christ has completed everything on their behalf that they could never do. When you're incarcerated to a sin nature, when you're depraved, there's nothing you can do to help yourself. Christ did it for you. But not only when we evangelize do we call people to a life of faith in Jesus Christ, we call them to a life of works. That's the balance. Salvation, justification is free. Sanctification is a life of works, working out that holiness, working out that practical righteousness that's been, dem- that's been deposited in you. So we call them to a life of works that makes that salvation evident. That's James' point here this morning. There is no justification without sanctification. And so the necessary complement of saving faith is works. Works. Not works that are born out of guilt. Not works that are born out of shame. Not works that are born out of, gee, I hope God's pleased with me now. I want to earn God's favor. That's settled. Your family, okay? There's a, there's a home right now waiting for you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I'd have told you. But if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You're already in the family. He's not going to get rid of you. But we work. Sanctification is a process of works that are born out of love for God. Out of gratitude towards what Jesus Christ has done for me. Works that are born out of joy. Of being in the family of God. Of having eternal truth. Of having the word of God. Of having the Holy Spirit. Of having the truth of God given to me as a a family member. To be given grace. To be given a spiritual gift to serve in the family of God. To have an eternal purpose. I was listening to a Dennis Prager Um, thing yesterday on YouTube and he said this is the most hopeless generation there's more depression today than there's ever been in light of technology we have better homes we have better clothing we have better food we have better health we have better anything than any generation has ever known on this planet and yet we're the most depressed all over the world why because we've jettisoned God we've gotten rid of God we have the joy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, whenever you reduplicate a word, it's a way of emphasizing. Greeks didn't have exclamation points, so if they wanted to emphasize something, they would repeat it. Jesus says, look, not everyone to me says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, but he who does, performs, Follows through with obedience the will of my Father. John the Baptist warned the scribes and the Pharisees when they came and they were seeking salvation and easy, easy believism. John the Baptist warned them by the river. He said, you better bring forth fruits in keeping with repentance. Don't walk away here thinking you'll be the same. Nobody who's been to the cross walks away the same man. Jesus said in John 15, every branch that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Gentlemen, God expects fruit on his trees. We have a lot of farmers and and vine growers in here uh, with vineyards this morning. What do you think if you plant something and it doesn't produce, what do you do with it? It never had life in the first place. And so, same thing with us. God looks at us and wants us to bear fruit for his glory, for his name. Here's a hard one, gentlemen, Not, not for the faint of heart. Your life, your behavior, your speech either brings fame or shame to the name of Jesus Christ. People are watching you. When you claim to be a Christian, they're watching us. We need, our, we need to let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I think the truth that we can extract from this text, which we're going to get into real shortly here. This is just an introduction for crying out loud. (laughs) The truth we can extract from James, which we will this morning, is whether we truly love God or how we love God is most often demonstrated in how we treat other people. In how we treat other people. Gentlemen, there are ten commandments. Four, how to relate to God. Six, how to relate to other people. Whether or not we love God shows in our works, and whether or not we love God shows in how we treat other people. James chapter 2, verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. 
James is anticipating, as Warren set the stage for us last week, some of you are treating the rich people with favor and the poor people you're neglecting. You're treating them with contempt. You're treating them with disdain. You're shaming them. Hey, rich man, coming in the door with position and power, sit here beside me, friend. <laughs> oh, the poor guy. I think there's a place over there in the corner for you to sit. And James says, look, don't think because you're obeying God in other areas of your life that's acceptable. If you break that commandment to love your neighbor, you break them all. Why? Because you've offended an infinitely holy God. I've often said if you slap me, there's no big deal to that. But if you slap President Trump, you're going to have a whole lot of friends in a, for, in, a, in a very short period of time. You've offended our president. When you offend a thrice holy God, it's not the size of the sin. It's the size of the person that you've offended. An infinitely holy God. That's why James can say if you stumble in one area, you've, you've wrecked the whole thing. Obedience is like a chain. You break one link and the whole chain is useless. For therefore God says do not commit adultery, and he also says don't commit murder. But if you do commit adultery, I'm sorry, but if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the whole law. We call this compensatory obedience. I'm really blowing it over here. I'm making a mess. So I'm going to give more effort to the areas where I know I can do better. That is not compensatory obedience. Gentlemen, that is disobedience. So speak and act as those who are led, verse 12, so as, as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Not the law in the Old Testament, but the law in the New Testament. The law of liberty that Christ offers, the law of grace. We will be judged, gentlemen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says we will all be judged for our works. Not whether or not we're saved. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're born again here this morning. And you have eternity in heaven. You have that as your hope. But... You will be judged for your works, and so will I. We will all stand before the Bema seat, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, 10. The Bema seat wasn't a judgment of acceptance or, or rejection. It was the, the, the judgment of rewards. You get a gold, you get a silver, you get a bronze. And that's the idea. It's when you get judged for the rewards. But verse 13, judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I've known some Christian men, and maybe you have too, that they use their, their theological knowledge, they use their knowledge of the Bible to alienate people. Somehow, through drawing near to Jesus Christ, they become more angry, more mean-spirited, more rude, bossy, commanding, individualistic, unyielding, unmerciful. What kind of faith is that? James says the judgment will be merciless to you who have shown no mercy. You who told that poor guy to sit over there in the corner, that's not showing mercy. You've been shown grace. Man, I tell you what, my fourth year in the Marine Corps, we were out in the Mojave Desert uh, living like rats for four months. I mean, we took a bath like or a shower once every eight days. I used to dig under the tank at night and sleep under the belly because it was nice and warm under there all night long in the desert. You know, it gets cold at night. I only told the driver, Buck, I said, Buck, if you go, because at night, you're not allowed to use lights in the Marine Corps, but you travel at night. You got little blackout markers, that's all you can use. And I said, Buck, if you start this thing up, just remember, I'm under here. Don't go anywhere, please. But it was safe under there because I knew somebody couldn't run over me in the desert. You put your, your, your sleeping bag out, and some guys get run over in the middle of the night. But when, but when, when Gary Fowler shared the gospel with me and said, Randy, you're a sinner, he didn't have to speak twice. No low contendery. I have no contention. <laughs> Guilty as charged. I have received mercy, and so have you. Gentlemen, if there's one thing this culture needs today is unconditional love and mercy. Don't expect it from the women and children first. You lead. You lead. You're the spiritual leader. Go home and lead in love this morning. Go in your neighborhoods and lead in love. Go to your businesses lead in love. Lead in mercy. Verse 14, this is kind of the, the pivot of the whole book, the, the theme. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? In the Greek, can that faith save him has a, has a negative particle. It's a may. It implies a no answer. May in the Greek implies no. No, that faith can't save him. You say you got faith, but you don't have any works. That faith can't save you. James says the only way I can tell if you're truly saved is by your speech. By the way you think, by the way you act, by your works. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is well, without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you don't give them what is necessary for the body, what good is that? 
Somebody comes in here, they haven't eaten for days, their clothes are disheveled and dirty, and you say, I'll pray for you, brother. Man, tough luck. And then you let them go, and you don't help them. James says, what what is that? Those of us that have received infinite graces from God, can we not give them to others generously? Like Paul said, to spend and be spent for the glory of God, for the cause of the gospel. Verse 17, faith, if it has no works, it's dead. You can't separate sanctification from justification. Someone may well say your faith, uh, some, someone may well say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Don't have time to unpack this. Basically someone is saying show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You can't show me your faith without works. You can't. Faith in order to be displayed requires good works. Verse 18, um, verse 19, you believe that God is one. You're theologically sound. James says you are doctrinally sound. You believe that God is one. Well, you do well. But the demons believe and shudder. Demons have a perfect anthropology, a perfect theology proper of the knowledge of God. Demons have a perfect Christology. They have a perfect doctrine of salvation called soteriology. They know all of that. If you were to put one here, do you believe Jesus is Lord? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died for the sins of people all over the world? Yes. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. They'll answer everything in the affirmative. You wouldn't distinguish them between another believer in the church. But the one question that separates them is, is Jesus your Lord? And they would say, absolutely not. The thing that distinguishes a demon between an angel and a demon is pride, self-will. God causes us to surrender our wills to him because faith without works is dead. That's a demonic faith. If you have a faith that is sound doctrinally but has no accompanying, no accompanying works, James says you better examine yourself. You better do some soul searching tonight. Are you willing to realize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. The word foolish is empty in the Greek. It's kenos. It means you shallow fellow, you vain fellow. James 1.22 would say you're self-deceived. If you have faith without works, you're not fooling God. In fact, you're deceiving yourself. Verse 21, was not Abraham, James picks the pinnacle, the great patriarch Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? That's not for the faint of heart. Abraham, yes, sir, go offer your son as an offering. Did Abraham delay? No, the text says he got up early, early the next morning. I don't think he slept a wink all night long. He got up early, loaded the donkeys, took two servants, took his son, took some firewood. And with obedience, he offered the son of promise. Through Isaac was supposed to come all the promises to Abraham that were distributed throughout all the earth. And God says, offer him. Hebrews, 1, or Hebrews 11 says, Abraham did it believing if God needs to raise the dead today, he will. But as a result of his works, his faith was perfected. Telos in the Greek, it was matured. How do you mature in your faith? You obey God. You walk in obedience. You walk in obedience. Verse 23, scripture was fulfilled saying, Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In, John, or, uh, in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him was righteousness. That was fulfilled in Genesis 22 and God said, go offer your son. There are times when God tests us. There's times when our works will display who we are and what we are. Verse 24, you see a man is justified by works. He is, he is vindicated. His faith is validated. His faith is verified. You're saved by faith alone, but that faith is verified. It is validated. It is shown to be real and true when your works follow therefore after. Once again, you cannot separate sanctification and justification. So James chooses the greatest patriarch. Now he chooses the lowest Gentile in the lineage of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? 
Two men from Israel came into Jericho. God said, I'm going to give you the promised land. Yeah, you've got rocks and sticks and swords. They've got fortified walls. I'm going to have to do something to convince you that I'm going to empower you, that I'm going to enable you to take this whole promised land. And so they went into Jericho, and God said, I want you to walk around it one time, six days. The, the last day, I want you to walk around seven times and shout. Rahab told the spies who were coming in before that destruction, look, we've heard of you. I'm terrified. We are terrified of you Jews. We've heard what God did in Egypt. We've heard what God has done east of the Jordan with you. Look, what do I need to do? And he said, well, put a, a scarlet uh, uh, cloth in your window, and everybody in your house will be saved that night. It, Rahab did that by faith. And she protected those men to the detriment of her own life. She protected those two, two Hebrew spies. And her, fa her faith was verified. It was validated through her works. And last of all, verse 26, which is now the third time we're repeating the same theme within the short period of the short verses that we've looked at. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Going to close here real quick, man. Two applications. Number one, I'm, I'm speaking to two people here this morning, two kinds of men. It's not the majority of you. It's just a couple of you. Number one, I'm speaking to, to you, those of you who have no works. You say you've had salvation, but there has been no significant life change. Maybe you attended church. Maybe you're going through the motions, but your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your relatives, your neighbors, your, your workmates have seen no dramatic life change. Examine your heart. James says that faith may be a dead faith. God is calling us to sanctification. We've been declared holy. We're called to living holy lives. Second group of men I want to speak to this morning are those who are allowing serious sin in their lives. You're doing great over here. You're doing wonderful. These are your areas of strength. This is to your forehand. But this is one or two areas over here. This is your backhand. This is the weak side. And this is where you're failing. This is where you're being discredited. This is where your fellowship is broken. This is where you're losing communion with God. This is where your boldness is being lost. This is where your courage is being lost. This is why you're confused. And this is why you don't love God and love your neighbor. Why you should? Because you're not filled with the Spirit. You're failing in that one area. If you break one link of the chain, gentlemen, you break the whole chain. So examine your lives. If there's a weak area, shore it up. Ask the Holy Spirit to consolidate his efforts in that area of your life and sanctify that area of your life. One of my favorite Puritans said, unsaving, self-deceiving faith makes a man more knowledgeable of God's law, but not more holy in obedience. Gentlemen, we're called to holiness. Last, last thing. Gentlemen, if somebody could watch your life all day long, if somebody could watch your life, and see how you act, how you interact with other people. How gracious you are, how loving, how kind, how considerate, how respectful you are. Would they conclude that you're a believer? When I became a Christian 41 years ago, a guy asked me, he said, would your life have enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Gentlemen, we need to start living like Christians. God, uh, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite pastors, John MacArthur, said all that our, our, our culture is experiencing today in the church, in the educational sector, uh, in our communities, all over, the, the, the reason we're experiencing such chaos is because of lack of male leadership, a lack of godly male leadership. In one sense, I don't care what they do in politics. It's very important. I want us all to be involved. But in one sense, I'd rather see the church rise up and say, we've got an answer, and it's free. And he's calling us. He's calling us to holiness. He's calling us to boldness, to courage, to stand up and be counted and let people know that there is an answer for all we're experiencing in these times of chaos, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it takes men like you. <laughs> Sanctification can never be separated from justification. Thank you, gentlemen.
How many? In check, check. Is this on? Is up? Good. How many know we serve a holy and awesome God? Lead us on, Bob. Okay, you guys, you know these words. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Nothing like closing this kind of a service with a hymn. That's been oh, that's such a great song. Hey, um, so you guys know uh, if there is sin in your life, you know how to deal with it. Get with a man. There's plenty of us here that would love to pray with you. There's plenty of us here that uh, will come up alongside of you and lift you up. Thank you, Randy. That hit us right between the eyes. That's exactly what we needed. Uh, if you liked this morning, 
Uh, we have a new YouTube channel, I've been told. <laughs> it's Overwhelmed by Grace. Uh, this message will be on YouTube. Uh, this is the kind of the uh, message that you want to copy that link and send out to other men, right? Um, you have Randy for the next two weeks. So grab a man next week and bring him here, and uh, let's shake the world. Okay, love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week. Grab a man. You know how it works. Grab a man, lay some hands on him, pray over that man, and let's shake the earth one more time for the glory of God and the souls of men. God bless you guys.